Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're so glad that you've joined us because we're here and we're ready to talk about plants, maybe even weather affecting plants. We are really happy to be here and we're glad you've joined us. So give us a call in just a moment. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of ACES at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And I teach um, things so that I would talk about maybe cut flowers, perennials, those kinds of things. But we have three highly intelligent and personable folks right here next to me. Look at them, don't they look personable? And so we're gonna find out what their expertise is and they'll do a, either a question or a show and tell. So Chuck Voigt, I'm gonna start with you, sir. Well, thanks, Diane. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm recently retired from the Department of Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. Um, my specialties are vegetables and herbs, but as you'll see tonight from my, the things that I'm reading, I, I can also do fruit and some other things uh, mm -hmm. in a pinch. So uh, the question I have is about an old pear tree, and it, it's uh, from a Lovington fan. Uh, most of the pears from our old tree have hard grainy areas around the seeds. I think it's a Bartlett that, that bought some red anjus and they have some grainy areas, uh, not as bad as ours. And they thought the rain might have uh, affected it or whatever. Um, pears have what are called stone cells in around the, the, uh, the, the core. Uh, these develop and in different years they might develop differently and in different varieties they might develop differently. Um, typically, the butter pears from Europe, who have very uh, soft melting flesh, uh, tend to have fewer of them, and the Asian pears tend to have more of them. Um, the, the bad thing for us is that the, the European pears like Bartlett get fire blight really, really mm -hmm. badly here, so it's almost impossible to grow Bartlett's here without spraying antibiotics or something on the trees. So uh, <clears throat> the best thing that I, c I can say about stone cells is that is one of the reasons why we pick pears mature green and ripen them off the tree because if you let them get to this stage of of yellowness on the tree they've gone a little too far and and they'll have maximum uh, stone cells in them which which get very gritty or else you have to cut a lot of the flesh away to get rid of them um, i also read today that that severe drought can, can cause them to clump together more, which would make them more noticeable than if they were just individual cells as opposed to bunches of them uh, clumped together. But I, I was so inspired by the pear questions tonight that I, that I brought some uh, that I found in the store today. This is a Bartlett and um, has a little bit of taper up on the top end, but it's a pretty full figured pear, um, does have relatively soft flesh. The anjo uh, tends to have almost no noticeable uh, uh, narrowing at the neck. It eventually gets narrow, but they tend to be kind of almost amorphous and in, 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 in kind of odd shaped. Uh, the red ones are uh, a sport, a chimera that happened to a Bartlett. The, the, the red skin was, was found on a sport and uh, just, just basically a Bartlett pear with a red skin on it. And then bear bosque, which has a very russet skin and a, a thin little neck. So that's uh, very, very different. Uh, but uh, all of these would have melting flesh. Uh, what a lot of, of the old pear trees that you find around uh, are kefir pears, which is, has some, some Asian pear in it, uh, the little round, crunchy ones that, that they sell as apple pears or whatever. Uh, the good thing about Asian genetics is that they're a little bit resistant to the fire blight. Mm -hmm. And so the old kefirs have lasted for 100 years on the old farmsteads. We had one. We actually had two. Um, and they get, they get grit cells really badly. And so you have to judge when they're mature green because if you pick them too soon, they kind of get rubbery mm -hmm. and pruney and don't work. So you have to kind of develop that. I think commercially they have... A tester that tests the, oh. you know, like punches one and, and can tell you the, the degree of softening that's happened, and you can do it that way. But as home gardener, you have to kind of develop. You don't want them to get, get yellow like that. You want them to get sort of, you know, a pale greenish like that one, which kind of says, okay, I'm done growing and, and I'm fully mature. Let, pick me off and let me write. And then what does one do to have it go in the house from that green to edible? 
Well, which I do every year. Yeah, we, we used to, to take all me. those papers, wrap them exactly. individually so that they don't touch each other. That way, one bad pair doesn't spoil the whole bunch. That's right. Um, so, uh, and then put them in a you know kind of a moderate place. You don't want to you don't want to cook them in a in a real hot place. You don't. If you want them to ripen, you wouldn't keep them in, in the cold either. So kind of room temperature and, and wrapped. Check them every once in a while. Kind of give them a, a mm -hmm. mild little squeeze test you, when they start to give. And, and you probably shouldn't forget them. That would probably, mm -hmm. yeah. If, if you forget them too long, the this, this stench yeah. will probably let you know yeah. that they've gone too far. I, <coughs> I really love pears, but I forgot one. So, But they're really well worth ripening. And you just, it's just the ethylene that builds up and helps right. it. Right. If, if you're in a hurry, you could probably, mm -hmm. you know, put them in a, in a brown paper bag or something and, and put them up fairly tightly so the ethylene really works on yeah. them. But generally speaking, you just, like, do a bushel of them in a box or whatever. Mm -hmm. Very things. good. Thank you for bringing in to let us see the range of That's pears that are possible. Use my own money. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you better eat one during the show. <laughs> I, I don't want to do a Bob Scruff. Okay. All eat, right. And eat through the whole show. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> all right. Thank you very much, Chuck. And let's go to you, Stacy Garwood. Hey. Hello. Um, I am Stacy Garwood, and um, I'm a gardener. Um, I would say my specialties are annuals and perennials. So if you have questions about those, I would answer those for you. And um, I have brought for my show and tell. Um, some different types of seeds that uh, I think would be fun to do with kids. Um, this would help keep kids interested in gardening and um, so I'll kind of go over the ones I brought in. Um, here is the the blue corn, um, just something a little different. Uh, you know, kids you are used to seeing, you know, the regular field corn or um, sweet corn, that type of thing, and this would just be something a little different. Um, this is the snake gourd. Now these would have to be planted, of course, in the garden and take a little while for them to mature, of course, into the fall. But at the end, um, the kids could, could dry them and they could decorate them. Just, you know, kind of something to watch. Um, then I brought some cat grass. Now this is a really good one, probably for the younger kids. Um, this germinates rather quickly so they don't have to be so patient um, and watching, <laughs> waiting mm -hmm. for the, the seeds to germinate. Um, so that's, that's a fun one. And then I also brought the sensitive plant seed. And this one is something that you could start in the windowsill at home or, you know, something and then transplant outside later. But this one, um, after it germinates and gets bigger, then if you touch it, then the leaves will curl up on it. So um, that's just something kind of fun and I think it's important um, for kids to to be interested in gardening and and start out yeah. start out early I like that you had shorter term ones to yeah. longer term gives them something all along all, the, the season. whole season yeah. that's really good well mm -hmm. thank you Stacy yes thank you and now we're gonna go next to dr. Jim Angel hey Jim hi uh, thanks for having me I'm Jim Angel the Illinois State climatologist at the Illinois State Water mm -hmm. Survey here on the campus of the University and I'm always interested in weather, climate, and how it affects gardening, and I'm kind of an amateur gardener myself. And one of the things that we talk about this time of year is frost. So if we look at frost in Illinois, the average dates are about mid-April in the center part of the state, and they're uh, early April in the southern part of the state, and late April in the, in the far northern part of the state. So it's all, all the dates are in April, but it's just uh, different parts of it. So. Southern Illinois actually gets a little longer growing season mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, now in recent years we've had some cases where we've had uh, a very warm March like this year and so things have kind of progressed very nicely and then we've had cold weather followed after that. So that can cause some damage and that's uh, certainly a possibility that this year we had big troubles in 2007 and 2012 uh, from those kind of combinations. So it is something to keep an eye on, watch the weather forecast and see uh, what's going to happen. Now the other question we have mm -hmm. here is uh, something about a dandelion problem. And we got this email, uh, it says my yard is in bad shape due to my illness. I can finally get outside and do some yard work and since the dandelions haven't emerged yet, what is the best weed product for lawns? And I want to get them now before they, they come out and I have mostly shade in the front yard and sun and shade in the backyard. 
Then after I weed the lawn, what is the best uh, mix of grass seed for overseeding in this zone? And I would say this was, the email was dated March 24th. I would say that, you know, looking outside tonight when we're uh, getting ready to go into the studio here, the, the dandelions are already out. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they're already, uh, many of them overwintered at this point, so they're on the go. So uh, you could use a, uh, a broadleaf herbicide, and there's several of them out there to, to garden supply stores to, to kill off the, what you got now. You could do, you really don't want to do a pre-emergent herbicide right now because if you're going to oversee, that's going to conflict with that and actually uh, do more harm than good. So you're probably just going to have to beat them with regular herbicide or somehow mechanically get rid of them. And then you can oversee, uh, you can look at, in a lot of stores they have mixes for uh, sh uh, partial shade and full sa shade uh, lawns. So you can try those and see which ones work. Uh, I always like the mixes that have more than one variety in them just because you get a little, uh, if one variety doesn't do well, at least you have a couple of different chances at getting it to go. Okay. Boy, all kinds of things going on. <laughs> you hope that the dandelions don't take over, but there they are. All right. Thank you, Jim. And let's go to our Did You Know segment next. Mosquitoes survive as eggs or in larval state during the winter. Female mosquitoes lay their eggs in the ground during late summer or fall, and they lie dormant until the temperature rises in spring. Okay, sorry we had to talk about mosquitoes, but let's cruise on and we're gonna go to line two with Danny's question. Hi, Danny, what's your question? Line two ashes about the only good use of them in the garden is to parch the hard corn for the Native American soup. Other than that, polishing soap is the only good use of hard wood ashes. Thank you. It broke up for me. I'm not, I'm not. I think the gist of it was the only good use for hardwood ashes in the garden is if you're parching corn or, or, oh. or somehow other, otherwise because it does affect the, the amino acids or something that makes it more oh, okay. digestible and more nutritious. Uh, Interesting. And, and, and that's good because uh, people ask about hardwood ashes all the time mm -hmm. and uh, basically uh, they're very alkaline and used in tiny quantities they might give you a little burst of potash and some other things but the but pH thing is, especially in the northern two-thirds of Illinois where the soils are young and mm -hmm. relatively alkaline to begin with, uh, wood ash is probably not, not good. If, but if it's hardwood. Hard. Har hardwood. You know, yeah, not. Well, yeah, they could be pine ashes too, but it, it's it, still. ashes in general are, are so good for making soap and not so much for fertilizing the garden. So be very careful by adding. <coughs> well, thank you, Danny, for that. I'm sorry I missed a little bit. Of, thank you, Chuck, for uh, hearing some of that. All right, we're going to go to line three, and Simon has a comment about pears. Hi, Simon. Evening. Actually, I just wanted to follow up on what Chuck was saying. Okay. Happy birthday, Chuck! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Simon. <laughs> Today? No. No, okay. So it's a happy, no pear comment at all? Okay, well, we've got... Uh, Chuck, there's your fan. There's your fan. <laughs> All right, let's go to Wade's question. He has a fruit tree question on line four. Hi, Wade. Hi. Um, my question is about frost. Uh, here the other night, it got quite cold, and uh, I uh, got up three or four times during the night and went out and sprayed them with water. And the blooms still look good. I uh, just wondered uh, what's your opinion does that do any good or, or does it protect the tree in any way so far it looks like it's working they spray fruit they spray strawberries in Florida I mean that's a very common way to protect fruit from but they don't do it frost. two or three times they do it continuously that's true because as the water freezes it it gives off a tiny bit of energy and it keeps the the buds themselves from freezing and, so, uh, Jim, would you comment? So it's, it's like a continuous process. Um, you know, doing it a few times might help if it's if it's borderline. If it's going to get really cold, uh, it it needs to be a little more aggressive than once in a while. 
But could we think? get you to comment on where they measure the temperature? Oh, okay. Well, that's <coughs> a good point. So when they do the official measurements, they're at five foot off the ground, so kind of basically eye level. So if you're down low on the ground, sometimes the cold air will settle down there, and so you get frost and, and cold temperatures right at the ground, even though we report maybe 34, 35 degrees. And so that's an issue. So sometimes they take advantage of that, and you can actually get fans and helicopters and and stir up the air around the orchard so that the high value crops so they can uh, do those kinds of things and, and like you were saying they, they do the spraying at my understanding they do that at commercial uh, fruit production in Illinois where they, yeah they just turn on the sprinklers and let it let it go uh, even well ahead of the event too because they really want to keep it protected all through the process there so it's a little hard to say if, if just watering it a couple of times during the event will do you much good it might, if you're lucky, if it doesn't get too cold, uh, that could be the case. But we've got some nights that are going to be fairly cold and also very windy in the mm -hmm. next couple of nights. So that could also be a problem as well as, as we get in through spring here. So it is never the same. There's never <coughs> a dull moment for a gardener. So I don't know if you want to take that as a positive or <laughs> negative. but. That is for sure. All right, well, thank you for your question. Let's go to Kathy's question on line six, and it's about mulch. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I had a big maple taken down and the stump ground, um, and I lost plants the last time I tried to use new mulch. Um, mm -hmm. What types of places can I put these new wood chips that they're not going to damage a plant? So, well, I'll start in, but you can use new wood chips if you put a newspaper layer underneath. So, I don't know, maybe around shrubs, nothing. I know. use them around pathways. Yeah, so pathways. Mm -hmm. But you've got a barrier between the decomposition where it, it uses up nitrogen in the soil. So, path, that would be a no problem. Yeah, Roz Creasy does that in California. She puts the fresh stuff on the paths, mm -hmm. lets it age for a year or something and then moves the beds oh. under the paths and, and she rotates she rotates and, and ages ages it that way while she's already getting some use out of it so that's that's oh, a possibility that's a great idea and I think with the newspaper you're just keeping it from robbing nitrogen from the soil that's all I'm doing yeah, yeah. Right. but it wouldn't hurt <coughs> the shrub I don't know right. that I'd put it around little, what do you think, No, animals probably and not, and no, I wouldn't. But trees, trees and shrubs, I think, would be. True. Yeah, would be okay. Yeah, you get one of those thick foliage trees that's killing everything under it anyway, that's. That's true. That's true. That's, <laughs> you, yeah. you always say plant mulch. <laughs> yeah. We used to say astroturf, but, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so there are some ideas for you. But I love the rotating of the path if you have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Right, because she changes hers every six months anyway, the, you know, the, because she, she's in California and she needs to oh. take pictures and mm. wow yeah okay now she's showing off <laughs> all right yeah. so but there you go for the mulch she does well, have banana slugs so okay so then we <laughs> everyone's got their, <laughs> their, their crosses problem. to bear yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> true <laughs> well we have a question from Hayes on line seven about rhubarb let's go to you next Hayes hello line seven. I just bought this place last fall and I was happy to see the uh, rhubarb plant mm -hmm. here, and it uh, is leafed out, but I see a big seed stem in the middle of it. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. <sighs> Tell her what to do for that. Well, uh, it depends on, on what the, the, the cultivar of rhubarb is. Uh, when you raise them from seed, they tend to make more seeds because the ones that are propagated vegetatively have been selected for not going to seed a lot. Um, if you're ha seeing a lot of seed heads coming, um, chances are that's what it is. All is not lost. Cut them off as soon as you can because they're going to take a lot of energy mm -hmm. out of the roots that the plant could use to make leaves. Uh, they only, they only uh, make seed heads once early in the season. So if you cut them off as soon as you see them, down as far as you can cut them off, uh, then more of the energy is going to be there to make uh, leaves later on. Okay, so that's a, it's not a never ending one, it's just when you first see them, so that's it's, easy yeah. enough to do. It's, it's like uh, where they grow chives, 
Mm -hmm. They flower in the spring and that's really annoying to them because they're trying to cut them and it's, it's a pain. To, they may even just throw away that first cutting to get rid of the seed heads and then cut oh. them four or five more times. The chives taste so good. I mean, the when flour. You're the, when you're in the business of like freeze drying chives. Right, and that's in, in not. For mass market all around the world. <laughs> you don't care about that. Seed heads are a pain. <laughs> <coughs> but in everyone in, else's. In, in your backyard, they're, they're a fine they're thing to, 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 yeah, to okay. put on your potato salad bowl and make it look really pretty. Exactly. <laughs> <coughs> well, we've had a lot of questions about fruit. Let's have a question about a vegetable. Let's go to McDaniel. And I think it's peas is the question. Line three. Hi there. Oh, hi. Yes, I have a question. We have peas up in our garden. Yes. And it's supposed to be 25 degrees on Friday night. So do we cover them? You know, I have peas up in my garden and I was going to do nothing. Is that a good idea? It's gone through a 28 degree night and it looks just fine, but they're only up an inch or so. Well, hers are up farther, it sounded like. Uh, you can get a harvest guard or a floating row cover and just put that over. You need to you know, make sure, but I don't think I'm gonna do anything on they, mine. They typically stand up to quite a bit. <coughs> well, and I think this time, uh, this spring, we've had some of these cold nights are going to be fairly windy, too, so that could be a challenge for any kind of cover on them. That's but true. So you if would you have do put to one, you really have to anchor it down well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, doesn't the wind, though, keep mixing things so it, it doesn't it's get that, that icy yeah. layer right at ground level? It does in the normal <laughs> case uh, where it's a you know calm, clear night that where you get the radiational cooling. Th we've got some cases this year where we've got cold air coming out, literally out of Canada, that's moving into our region. Yeah. So we're well below average on temperatures for April so far. So yeah, there's some of these nights it's gonna be kinda hard to dodge the ball. The bullet. good point is it's not going from 60 degrees to 25. I mean, it's right. it's keeping it consistent. It should be acclimated a little bit. And yeah, it's right. It okay. says plant peas as soon as you can work the soil. Yeah, and that's and, what and I did. Yeah, people do that. That's the first thing they, they get in. It's the thing they brag about. You know, have you picked peas yet? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I, uh, I think I'm they, leaning they, towards I think not I, doing I, anything. I think they're pretty tolerant. Uh, if, if you're really nervous, yeah. maybe try to get something over them, but, um, th but they're not real. You have to use some sort of a prop because they're not going to, the, the, the thing over them might do more damage hurt. than the than the cold right. if, you, if you don't have some sort of a hoop or something sort of that a, holds it off of them. A, right. Something firm or tenting. Um, it, yeah. Uh, I often use four by fours when there's just some, you know, if I have any, there's just a little bit of something higher and then it would go over it and not, but I'm thinking about doing nothing. So if I'm sobbing next week on the show, I still have room to plant them again. But, but if you are nervous, I think maybe do get a floating row cover and use some kind of a barrier for that. Okay, well, let's do another question, and this time it's going to be a peach tree question. Let's go to Bill's question on line two. Hi, Bill. Yeah, I've got a peach tree. It's about 10 years old, mm -hmm. and the peach is never getting no bigger than a quarter on it. Okay, so we're going to look over to Chuck. Aren't you glad? <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to be needed. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, usually when peaches don't size up correctly, it's because there's too many of them. Uh, peaches are, are probably the worst fruit tree for putting on way more blossoms than they can mature to full-size peaches. Uh, I, I think the, the rule of thumb that we use is, is that peaches should be at least three to four inches apart. Um, and you can achieve that in, in a, a variety of ways. Um, uh, first of all, pruning. When you're, when, you're, when you're doing your late winter pruning on peaches, uh, take back the bearing wood by at least a third, if not a half. That gets rid of some of them. Um, and then you'll have you know, more foliage to, 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 to nourish those. And then if you still get them, you know, where they're like peach to peach to peach when they're less than an inch, uh, you have to bite the bullet and go out there and take some of them off mm -hmm. uh, because they really need to have, you know, if you want, <laughs> if you want a, a two and a half inch peach, you need to give need to give it about three inches to grow to that size. Mm -hmm. So thinning I is an issue. I know sometimes a mild frost or a, a partial mm -hmm. frost will actually thin them out, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't just kill them all, uh, 
the, it helps. The, the, the actual peach growers think that's not such a bad thing <laughs> because then they don't have to thin so much and thin, you know anything where you have to either do it by hand or uh. there's a chemical way to do it that's that's a little more dangerous. Um, but a homeowner could do it. Yeah, if you just have a couple of trees, uh, just go out mm -hmm. and and bite the bullet and get rid of every other one or two out of three or whatever it takes to get them get them good spacing and then hopefully you'll have enough leaf area to nourish those to full-size peaches. So there you go. <coughs> That's a good question, Bill. I have heard that question several times. It's just hard to thin. It's hard to plant thick and thin. It's hard to thin. So, wow, the show is quickly passing. Thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.